to institute then talk by Doug Romato, the director of Minnesota University of Minnesota Press. And um, it's my pleasure. I'm Ron Brolio, the associate director of the Institute. And it's my pleasure to welcome Doug as part of our scholarly uh, series on publications. We'll be having another one in on with the University of Chicago Press in May. And uh, we've already had several. You can look on our YouTube site for information about those. So um, Doug is the director of the University of Minnesota Press, where he acquires a variety of books and uh, heads of staff and sort of shepherds uh, some scholarly activity. And he's had almost uh, four decades in scholarly publishing in his career with uh, Columbia University Press, Basic Books, Louisiana State University Press, University of Georgia Press, Johns Hopkins. And he served two terms on the Board of Directors of the Association of American University Presses, who's also the organization's president. So the man knows a few things about uh, publishing with uh, University Press. And one of the reasons I, um, it's a real honor to have Doug here, is um, the experimental nature of the press and the breadth, scope, and its copious, um, it, it, it's copious investigations um, and its copious listing as well. And so one of the things I like is to hear Doug talk about how he thinks as a director, as someone who's shepherding books, acquiring books, and, and seeing the directions for individual uh, authors, but also more broadly for a variety of fields. We were talking briefly about uh, the cookbook series and actually the, the sort of importance these days of cookbooks and how that's uh, seen a resurgence. So it's interesting to see what uh, becomes um, increasingly relevant or is a hot topic or has, um, has some purchase. So in any case, I don't want to take up too much time. I want to give this to, uh, to Doug and he'll uh, give a presentation, then answer some Q&A. For folks online, you can always um, use the, the Q&A buttons to uh, ask your questions uh, and we'll try to field those as well. So please join me in welcoming Doug. Thanks. It's uh, good. Good to be here. Good to uh, you know. I haven't actually done. I uh, used to do a lot of these uh, live uh, presentations, but not, not so much the last couple of years. So um, so it's nice to be back in that game. Um, I do think that um, questions are really great. So um, you know, just conversations and discussing things. So uh, think about you know other things I can address. But uh, what I'm going to do, and Ron mentioned. Uh, experimental. Um, so what I'm going to do is almost what you might consider to be um, a little bit of a fantasia of contemporary scholarly publishing first, a little bit of a speculative approach to, to what it is and what it feels like and, and how it proceeds. Um, but then I think move sort of into some more practical uh, issues after I've, um, after I've sort of, you know, gotten that out of my system, um, so to speak. Um, but, uh, but I do think that uh, the sort of knowledge landscape that, that we're all um, contributing to and um, experiencing as readers and as students and as teachers, it is just changing really rapidly. And I don't think we've really caught up with it intellectually at this point. I think we still see it in this, this sort of frame of, um, you know, the monograph, the single authored study. Um, and, uh, and it's actually a lot richer than that and a lot more curious. So, uh, so that, that's what I hope to sort of suggest with this. So um, with uh, no further ado, as the saying goes, um, I'll just jump into that. So um, in the um, Albanian novelist Ismail Kaderi's 1980 novel, The Palace of Dreams, uh, spies lurk in the corners of taverns, coffee shops, town plazas, parties, and other gathering places in order to overhear people talk of the dreams they had the night before, and then report them to a central agency where they're analyzed and correlated with other overheard dreams for the indications they may provide 
about events and attitudes that will emerge from the subconscious to action and tangible reality. Kaderi's vision of a surveillance bureau for the unformed, still emerging impulses and desires revealed in a network of dreams is actually a fair approximation of the university press editor's practice and the era of digital culture. We are increasingly in a position of tracking scholarly ideas as they emerge and take shape, correlating them with other emerging concepts, seeing them shared or challenged and monitoring them as they coalesce into tangible form. Somewhat akin here to William Gibson's famous definition of cyberspace as a collective hallucination. The emerging scholarly spaces on the web, which include individual and collective blogs and scholars use of commercial spaces such as Twitter and Facebook and other online spaces such as um, syllabi, CVs, conference programs, open access journal articles, all of this becomes for the university press editor a kind of collective scholarly becoming. As scholarly communications, as distinct from scholarly publishing, pursues its day-to-day -day life via this informal digital media, editors are in a position to track scholarly ideas as they emerge and take shape, correlating them with other emerging concepts, seeing them shared or challenged, and monitoring them as they coalesce into tangible form. We see scholarly projects emerge serially from the larval stages of social media um, through the chrysalis of blog posts and conference papers. And unlike other forms of editorial sleuthing, we can simultaneously obtain a sense of reception and audience. Um, you know, the extent of an author's network and even the author's aspirations. Um, the editors with whom I work are constantly sending each other links to traces of projects, and many of them are very early stages. We also discover books that are unaccountably out of print and indications of authors that need to be translated online. To use another William Gibson concept, the scholarly acquisitions editor's work is increasingly that of pattern recognition and not the mere bureaucracy of peer review that some imagine. As you'll gather, I see scholarly editing not as taking place within the major disciplines, but in the interstices between established areas and in the intellectual discontent with them. Sometimes accused of rushing to trendy areas of scholarship, university presses, when they're at their best, provide an alternate locus of accreditation for emerging areas of scholarship and scholarly method. And by working across institutional boundaries help correct for localized pockets of conservatism. As universities address their continuing budget crises by combining departments, shuttering interdisciplinary centers, tightening tenure opportunities, university press imprints are even more important as a validation of the innovative and boundary challenging work. And we have a commercial motivation in this as well. With the senescence uh, of academic libraries, which they account for at most a quarter of university press bookseller sales, and post pandemic that looks more like um, 15%. Uh, and the outsourcing of library selection functions to corporate vendors, the only scholarly books that get attention and usually succeed in the marketplace are those that are intellectually ambitious, that innovate, and that take chances. I've had occasion to think through this even more recently while working with a young scholar named Abram Foley on his just published book, The Editor Function, which recognizes how book editing, publishing, and distribution themselves have a poetics and play an active part in shaping how we can think about the literary field, doing so through a close study of avant-garde enterprises, including Dawkey Archive, Fiction Collective Two, Semiotext, and the irregular magazine Handbone. Following Foucault's famous delineation of an author function, Foley suggests that non-corporate publishers work against the editor function of mainstream presses by promoting radical alternatives to mainstream, though non to the mainstream through non-industrialized, anti-quantitative practices that include, uh, quoting from Foley, correspondence, judgment, friendship, and rivalry formation. To which I'd add, critically, reading curiosity, hunches, risk-taking, and trust. And those are actually the factors which lead to the really great books on a presses list. So um, 
Foley posits in this study that independent publishers play a theoretical role in critiquing what he calls the publishing industrial complex, which I'd extend to the academic industrial complex, and seek to thus attain escape velocity from what too often looks like a stultified culture. Scholarly editors shape the direction of knowledge present and future. The Polish science fiction writer Stanislaw Lem posed in his 1976 philosophical work, Soma Technologie, the problem of peak information, the human inability to process the information it creates. Lem writes, what will happen to a civilization that does not manage to overcome its information crisis? It will become transformed from one that studies everything, as ours does at this moment, to one that only focuses on a few selective directions, which each one of those directions gradually beginning to experience the lack of resources, their number will steadily decrease. That is, information is not controlled. The danger is, is that information will narrow to just a few more manageable areas. As Lem projects, without management, without gatekeeping, information will lose its vitality. Superfluity, overabundance, both those only lead to crisis. Information needs to be managed, regulated, constrained, selected, or it will decline and face a kind of extinction in an apocalyptic battle of the disciplines, the precursor to which is the STEM versus humanities divide we see in much of today's academy. In that context, publication by a university press means something academically, academically but it also means something economically. It is both an evaluative process of peer review and faculty board approval and an evaluating in terms of the press's decision to invest financial and personnel resources in a particular writer's project. At a time when the humanities and social sciences are being devalued within the academy, formal book publication signals that such works have an economic worth, that they have readers, and are more than what is sometimes deflatingly called academic work product. So my general feeling, as I, I hope this sort of makes clear, is that um, the presses operate at best to look for something distinct, something unique, something that breaks out, something that moves discourse forward, something that is actually um, taking risks. And so very much what we're all pursuing is a kind of risk assessment uh, when we're looking at a project, like, you know, what, what is there here? What is the potential reward? And that isn't just an economic reward. In a lot of cases, it's a collective sense of moving a project forward. There's been a lot of discussion, especially recently, um, about uh, which tends to see academic books in the same mode as general interest books, like how many copies did it sell? You know, you know, you know, what did it, what did it bring in? You know, did it break through? What's a good amount to sell? In fact, you need to look with a much larger lens than that is always my sense. You need to look at the lens of um, not so much an individual project, but how it contributes to a list, to a larger group of books, to an academic discussion, to a discourse. And that's where the value comes from. The value comes from this larger entity. Um, this is really our form of um, basic uh, research in the humanities. This is how it proceeds. So you might not have a large, you probably won't have a large readership of a very technical, um, say, scientific article in biochemistry, but it joins with other articles to build into something much larger and much more critical and much more sustainable. And so that's what we're trying to do. We're not we're, we're working with individual, we, we care about individual books, but we also really care about their context. Um, and how they fit with other books and the kinds of discussions that those books collectively bring up. And to some extent, how they um, correct for each other, how they're in discussion. Um, and so we're often in a situation in Minnesota, especially of publishing books that contradict things that we did 10 years ago or that critique it. And that's really important. Uh, anytime you try and sort of have, a, you know, pose a certain purity on publishing, you're, you're making a mistake um, because um, the discourse just keeps changing and that's its real strength. Um, so um, what I want to uh, get at sort of now is just um, what this all means for scholars um, seeking academic publishers for their works and progress, sort of the more 
uh, nuts and bolts idea. Um, so um, I have just some uh, things to keep in mind. And the most important one of them all is um, think of your audience. Um, what lively scholarly conversations do you want to enter into with the project that you're writing? Um, the market is driven by individual interests, not, only, not by systems. And today, many libraries, for instance, only purchase books when it is demonstrated that they actually already have readers. Um, a lot of times, a, a library catalog is actually, um, it's, a, it, it's kind of a hollowness. The libraries largely don't actually own the things which are in the catalog. Um, they're things which are available through vendors and can be provided when someone is interested in it. So libraries today are for the most part not acquiring something with the idea that there is or should be a readership. They're indicating what they can provide access to. Um, so in terms of being a, an author, a scholarly author, it's important to basically conceptualize the work you're doing uh, with that readership in mind, because the way it will end up permanently in a, a university library collection, for instance, is by having people request it and click on it. Um, there are programs at a lot of universities, not by, by all means, not all of them, but, but quite a few where basically um, the library's purchase is determined by how many times it's clicked on um, within the catalog. And so if there are 10 scholars on a campus who click on it and say, this is a work I'm interested in, this is a work I want access to, the library will purchase it and then it'll be in the collection permanently. So um, it's really critical as an author to think in terms not of, oh, I'm writing in um, you know, a particular area and therefore my book will be in any library that collects this area because it, it'll only be there if people are really interested in reading it for the most part. So audience is absolutely critical and being part of a discussion is also really um, critical, sort of um, you know, being able to take someone else's work and um, show what its implications are and being able to um, pull together things that aren't usually juxtaposed and, um, and, and pull them together and create a new space out of that. So again, my first um, bit of advice is think of an audience. Um, the second is um, think of your structure. Um, the traditional monograph is, um, has a, has a particular structure, which is not always um, user-friendly. Um, there's a great history, um, especially now, um, you know, with digital access in which only parts of books are read, which probably isn't the result you want because um, that isn't what excites people. So very often your a digital search and most library catalogs are obviously digital. What that will lead to is people saying, oh, that, that chapter is pertinent to me. So they'll access that chapter. It's sometimes called slicing and dicing, which is a, a particularly nice phrase, but that's what it's often called. Um, similarly, there's a, um, there's a, a great tradition of people reading the introductions to books and stopping there and not reading the later chapters. Um, I, I submit that you and we want to avoid that. We want people to read books as books. Um, we really want them to take in the full argument. And one way that you can make this happen is through um, the structure um, of the project by um, you know, basically um, not just having the traditional introduction and then four case histories, but putting, them, putting your chapters in dialogue with one another, having them speak to one another, making them very, very difficult to slice and dice and pull together. And that's what creates a book that um, very often I hear this from scholars that, that I work with, that you know, the books they really value are the ones that they, they get them from their library, they get them on sort of a temporary digital loan, and they realize they need to have it. They realize that it's still rich, that they want to understand all the parts of it. And so um, they'll purchase it or they'll, they'll access it again and again. So you want a book that really um, pulls you in that way. Um, it's also worth thinking um, when you think of your topic, um, whether an alternate publication mode um, is better for the project that you're working on. Um, and all these modes are out there right now. Um, short books is one, networked books, um, books that are multimedia, open access. And all of these things uh, ha have an impact on audience and on the structure of the book. 
So thinking when you have an idea, whether it really is the traditional um, 70,000 to 120,000 word monograph, or whether what you're creating isn't really more, you know, sort of a short incisive book, or whether what you're creating would work better as a multimedia book or a book with a multimedia analog. Um, or whether the kinds of engagement that you want uh, leads towards looking for an open access model a book that lives on the web, you know, rather than a traditional book, which is what. So when you're thinking of your structure, just think, you try, try and not turn it immediately into a monograph. Um, unless that, that's what you need in a lot of cases in the humanities, that's kind of what you need <laughs> um, to start. Um, and uh, Great things can happen when you do that. One of our most successful initiatives right now in Minnesota is a, a short series called um, Forerunners, a book that are actually 10,000 to 12,000 words long. And they're just little books with, uh, we think of them almost as academic, you know, B-sides and outtakes. They're just little discrete books, which just sort of introduce an idea. They're not the last word on the topic. They try and be the first and they can move really fast. And they're not for every scholar, but for some scholars, they actually, they can get a core idea out there. And it may be an idea they'll return to in a full length book later. Um, but it's a great way to just sort of begin to signal um, their scholarly investment in that. Um, the third um, thing in terms of getting a book published is to make your introduction compelling. Uh, make the introduction of the book compelling. Um, the introduction is doing a lot of work for projects right now. Um, and that has to do partly with um, time and with the way people um, access things. Traditionally and very often, and I think Minnesota probably uh, suffered from this more than most presses, the introduction was the often the, the, the least friendly and worst written part of the book because it was doing all of the theoretical heavy lifting. Um, that was where the concept was outlined, where its connection with other scholarship existed. Um, but at this point, you know, what you really want to use as an introduction is to open up a topic for people, to show how it connects to other things, to not so much using it as like this dense, you know, overview, but use it as something which sort of traces the implications and how something matches up. So if an introduction peaks thought, um, that's really one of the best uses of the introduction for a book right now. Uh, the fourth, and I think this is um, becoming more important, but it's gonna become even more important is to think about your illustration program um, right up front. Um, when you write your project, um, think about whether it needs illustrations and think about what those illustrations are um, because um, people increasingly read books visually. Um, they, uh, you know, if you're writing on something that is exceedingly well known, um, it could be that, you know, people will just um, go on the web and find it and it will be right there. Um, but in a lot of cases, um, some of those interesting books are dealing with things which have to be um, reintroduced to the public or, you know, disappear things. I work a lot in uh, digital technology, um, books on digital technology and uh, media archaeology. And a lot of cases, this is dealing with objects which are like, you know, they're, they're, they're dinosaurs. I mean, they're like extracted out of the muck of history. And so being able to, you know, bring these objects out visually and show people what they look with, what they look like, and thinking from the beginning about not only finding those images, but finding the best images and finding ones that will reproduce well, um, you know, that are of high quality is really useful going in. And uh, most editors at a very early stage will want to engage with what kind of book they're looking at. Um, and illustrations are a major part of that. Um, and when you think about your um, illustration program, um, think about it as a program, um, as, as a coherence. Uh, the, a lot of times, you know, when I'm working with authors, I'll say, you know, you know if your book is going to be significantly illustrated, you know, pick a certain number for every chapter. You know, don't just have all of them clumped together in one place, but have them spread throughout the, the work. You know, have them really, you know, make it, as, make it as compelling and as appealing as the other parts of your book. So think that way, or possibly you might just have, you might only have one thing you need to illustrate in one chapter. 
And that's another way of possibly organizing it. But, but think about sort of a rationale for the number of illustrations you have. The worst thing is when I'll get a manuscript as an editor and there'll be, um, and the author will say, well, I have, you know, 30 illustrations and, you know, 24 of them will all be in one chapter and they'll be scattered elsewhere through there. Um, it, it means a lot of, a, you know, print and even a digital environment to be thinking through illustrations from the beginning. Um, the fifth um, sort of bit of advice is um, to have a, an active online presence. That's how people discover you. And it's how they make you, um, it's how they, they, they see uh, the kinds of people that they're in discussion with. And this doesn't necessarily mean, you know, be out there on social media constantly, you know, because we all understand the sort of stress of that and, and other issues. But what it does mean is um, to just, you know, that when people search for you, and they will, to um, have some kind of presence out there. And it can be your own website. It can be a really good use of your, of your university's website for you with like a lot of links or just good information because people will be sort of saying, oh, this, this project looks interesting. Who is this person? <laughs> <laughs> you know, what else are they interested in? What are their other thoughts? And it's amazing how often when you sort of do a deep dive into people's digital identity, you discover things that you weren't expecting. Um, so you'll have a scholar coming out of one area, and you'll see that they're interested in something else as well. I think, well, maybe they can bring this part forward here. Or you'll see some journal articles they wrote that look like they could be part of a project. So have some information out there because one of the first things I think every any university press acquisition center does when they're in discussion with someone is just you know an act of discovery to see what's out there. Um, uh, then uh, the other thing is um, I think my sixth point is um, that as you're sort of thinking about submitting a book, the best thing to do is to make a list of the presses and editors that you might want to work with. Uh, and I think one of the best places to start with that is look at your own library, look at the books you're buying, look at who publishes them, look at the read the acknowledgments, see who's acknowledged, um, just sort of get a sense of you know where. Um, the books that, that are influencing you um, were published. And that's one of the easiest ways to get an editor um, to sort of find the right editor, the editor who will be interested in a particular project. Um, you know, another way to, to do that is um, when you're entering into dialogue with an editor, um, the best authors are usually self-selecting. Um, that you'll get a letter which will say, the reason I think this is good for you, or the reason I think this is a book for your press, and they'll just cite the books that you've published which have influenced them or that are really important to them. And that's when you can sort of say, oh, I see how this connects in, because it isn't really always apparent. You know, because um, a lot of editors or, you know, editors by and large are handling, you know, nearly um, seven, 60 or 70 projects at once because you're, you're handling the projects which have just gone into production, you're handling the ones that are just published, and you're handling the ones which aren't in production yet, uh, which are in consideration. And so you don't immediately make the connections, and a lot of times the authors make the connections before I do. Um, they'll sort of say, well, the reason I really want to send this to you is that you've done this book and this book and this book and this book, and you're saying, oh, I see where this fits in. I see how this comports. So it's actually really useful in those letters to... Um, you know, to sort of think about, um, you know, indicating why you're selecting a press and, and make it conscious, not just sort of, um, you know, well, I'm sending this to you because I'm sending it to eight presses at once, you know, sort of make that connection. Um, it's also um, just as a sort of small guideline that um, if a project is um, multiply submitted to several presses, um, just to be upfront about that, so an editor knows that you know, you're talking to several um, publishers at once um, because that'll to some extent um, just sort of inform them of, of what you're thinking um, and it avoids a lot of awkward moments down the line. Um, my seventh um, bit of guidance is um, what I just always refer to as activating your network. Um, everyone, every scholar um, has a network of people who have 
published books or are in the process of publishing books. Um, and you have mentor networks and other things. And it's really worthwhile just sort of saying, you know, I'm really interested in publishing my book with X and you publish with them. You know, what was that like? Can you connect me with them in some other way? An awful lot of the time, you know, what gets my attention is an email from an author I love working with who says, you know, this is scholar doing this work and I think you'd like them. I think you'd be interested in the work they're doing. And that helps raise my antenna. Um, University of Minnesota Press publishes, for instance, just as an example, um, we publish about 110 books a year, we're small, um, and only 80 of them are new manuscripts. Um, we get over 2000 submissions a year um, and, and just absolutely pure math. Um, you know, most of those are projects that probably do make sense for us, but, but something has to sort of guide them to us. And it's, a, it's an astounding just sort of flood of ideas. And a lot of times, you know, down the road, I'll be looking through another press's catalog and I'll just sort of see a, a book which I, you know, thought was interesting, but didn't quite chase. And I'll say, oh, that's good. That one ended up there, that one. We all sort of work collectively in a lot of ways, um, but it's good to do something when you're looking for a press to just sort of bring yourself a little bit, bring your project a little bit to the fore um, and think that way. So it's never too soon to activate your network, you know, I was talking to Ron last night about a project that I've literally been chasing for 10 years. I mean, it's been developing for 10 years. And, you know, that's both wonderful, um, but it's also partly why this business drives you crazy, um, you know, because you'll sort of have this vision of, you'll say, wow, that's such a great book. And, you know, that could be such a great project. But then, you know, the author has to write it. They have to research it and they have to write it. And a lot of times authors will check in with me who I haven't heard from in a couple of years and say, still interested, still interested. So it really is useful to have a conversation open from an early stage because then I can advise the author on how they're developing the project, um, you know, how they're going at it um, in a project that um, I think is going to be really great. Um, this happens more often than you, you, you probably want to think about, but this is a project I've known about for 10 years and about three years ago, um, MIT Breast brought out a book which looked very similar, you know, you know, well ahead of when this book I've been tracking was going to come out. And so the author was immediately just saying, okay, this other book is coming out and I know this person's work and I think it really is different. And, I was able to strategize with the author who is pretty close in the grand scheme of things to completing his project. I'm like, well, point your book more this way. You know, this is the part we probably want to bring out, you know, and this, it's also very true that on projects which develop over a long time, you know, the scholarship changes too. You know, new books come out that relate to it in one way or people get interested in different aspects of things. So it's really good if you connect with an editor that can almost help strategize and talk you through the process as you're writing. Um, and uh, that's really, I think, another good way to um, sort of plant your project. And if the author invests, if the editor invests their time in helping you develop a project, then they're really gonna wanna see it happen. They're gonna wanna see it come off. Um, my eighth thought um, is that the proposal is your roadmap. Um, proposals are, really critical um, in terms of the scholarly projects. Um, they're uh, a sort of tangible sense of what you, where you think your project is going to have its impact and, and what it looks like. So I'm a big fan of proposals. There are scholarly editors who really hate proposals and they're like, oh, go write the manuscript and send it to me. You know, I wanna judge it when it's a completed work. And I think it's an efficiency thing. But for me, seeing a proposal, um, really helps see where I can make a difference, um, you know, or where I can be involved and where an author doesn't waste time writing a project in one way that won't develop into, you know, a Minnesota book. Um, so a proposal is really great. And our standard proposal form, um, it's, it's a loose structure, but it's a very useful structure. We ask people to tell us very briefly, do a, obviously a summary, like what is this project about? Um, what's its argument? Minnesota is an argument-driven press. All, almost every book we publish has an argument. 
It's, it's trying to say something. It's trying to demonstrate something. So we ask for that project description to really bring out that argument. Uh, we then ask an author in the second part of a proposal to show where it fits in the literature, um, to show how it connects with other scholarship, what books have influenced it, what books are similar but are different. And that helps us sort of say, well, what does this area look like? And it gets us up to speed there. And it also shows us how the author is thinking about their work and in, in, in sort of connection. Um, and then uh, the third part of our proposal is generally, um, you know, just a chapter by chapter summary of how the book is going to function and how it's going to operate on the notorious chapter summaries. Um, and that helps us to sort of understand how the book proceeds and just, um, you know, really how the chapters uh, sort of uh, build on one another or in some cases don't. So that's another part of the proposal. And the fourth part is usually just sort of the, um, the specifications of the manuscript. Like how long do I think this is going to be? When do I think it's going to be done? What parts have been published? And so th these proposals are really great as sort of a point of agreement. Um, proposals um, are exceedingly um, fungible. Um, projects change. They don't have to like sort of stay exactly on um, the sort of model set up in the proposal. It's really common for a project to change a lot in a proposal for a chapter to drop out or another chapter to be added. And that's all great. But having that first proposal, you know, gives you something to build on, something to go back to. Um, so um, my ninth point, and I basically have 10, though I have an 11 as well. My ninth point is um, be upfront about your timelines and deadlines. Um, that's really important in this crazy time um, that we're dealing with. Um, you know, if you um, need a book because you're thinking you'll go on the job market or looking for another job um, or there's another kind of urgency, it's great to know that up front so we can point um, the um, consideration process towards it. Um, it's always best to clarify that the, you know, worst moment is when someone, you know, just says, oh, I have to have this now. <laughs> it's like, I'm sorry, we have like a lot of procedure still to go through here. So knowing how we can plan, it's a, you know, the, the consideration process is in its own way very flexible. And so knowing up front exactly what the timelines and deadlines might be is really critical. Um, the 10th, and this is so important, is just a follow-up. Um, you know, it's a, a lot of proposals hit us. Um, we do um, lose track of them or we get pulled into other things. And if you haven't heard, from, if you if you sent an editor or something you haven't heard from in a while, just sort of say, hey, just want to know if you have any advice for me at this point, or wanted to check in, or this is where I am, or it's just always great to think of these as ongoing projects. And so, um, you know, being nudged a little bit is actually really useful in terms of the time management. Um, an email, you know, is just a yeah. It, it, it's a necessary morass, but it is a morass, and it just you know builds constantly, um, you know, into these things where you you lose all sense of time in email, or at least I do. Where something comes to you, and then I'll hear from an author saying, "Oh, I was wondering if you got that message from such and such," and it's like, "Really? That was seven weeks ago? <laughs> like, what happened?" Um, happens all the time. Um, so it's really great to have authors and potential authors continue to be in touch um, about things. Um, so those are my, my major points. It's just sort of basic um, advice. Um, it's really useful thinking through these issues. There are um, books by a former um, University Press colleague named Bill Germano, which really can help um, guide through this process. Uh, they're published by the University of Chicago Press. Um, for first time authors, he wrote a book called uh, From Dissertation to Book which is just a, it's just a brilliant summary. I mean, absolutely brilliant summary of how to make that um, process. Um, unlike what people often say, a lot of the best books we publish, a lot of the most successful books we publish are revised dissertations. So you'll very often have people who will sit at a podium like this and say, we don't, I hear this, other, you know, we don't do revised dissertations. We're not interested. The fact is, is that a lot of the biggest selling books my press publishes are, are revised, have their origins in dissertations. 
scholars very seldom have the, the built-in time to do research that they have in a dissertation and to make the best of that. So, um, so Bill's book shows exactly how to get from one place to the other. And uh, it's just a great, great resource. And for um, authors who've already published, um, that he wrote a, another book for Chicago called Getting It Published, um, which is also just a you know, great savvy advice about how to navigate this system um, and find the best home for your book. So I think that that's basically what I have, though, you know, other things I could say. <laughs> so, I don't know, are there questions or thoughts? Yeah. Hello. Um, I really loved what you said about, well, I loved your talk as well. It was really interesting. But I, I really particularly liked what you said about shorter books mm -hmm. as well, particularly for tenured academics who are really stretched for time. I think it's fantastic. Uh, coming from Australia and also knowing the UK system, the really interesting thing about that is that most of university systems there won't take short books. It doesn't count for research points towards your career. Right? Mm -hmm. So it's it's how do we advocate? How do the press advocate to universities and to the research structures within the universities that hey, this is a good thing because it's going to get more readers and it's going to get more engagement and impact. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, it, it really needs to happen, particularly in the UK and Australia. I don't know about the US. I'm assuming it's not quite the same here. So, <laughs> it is. It's a barrier. Right. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I just, it's just like, how do, we, how do people advocate? How do presses advocate? Let, let universities know that, hey, these are still reviewed. It's still, it's still strong arguments. It's still this. It doesn't matter if it's 20,000 employees or less. Yeah. I mean, we advocate mostly by doing. Um, you know, that's that's the strongest advocacy, you know, we can we can make. And um, you write about these short books. I mean, and one of the things they do is that they, they just get ideas out there to broader audiences of scholars. Yeah. I mean, and very often, you know, the, the, there's the monetary investment in scholarly reading, but there's also a significant time investment and in trying to convince a scholar outside of a specialty to read a 70,000 word book takes a lot, but, you know, if it's 10,000 yeah. words, they'll read an area that, that's tangential to them, and so it makes a difference. Um, so Forerunners, which is what this series is, was our, our first attempt to sort of um, open up this space, and uh, basically it gets better every year, um, you know, in terms of the receptiveness to, to these little books, and what we're planning to do next is to use the same um, workflow that we've created for forerunners and begin expanding it to slightly larger entities. We don't want to, you know, make that series blow. We don't want, <laughs> you know, which is always the danger um, in a word process world. Um, but we do want to begin um, changing our own model to, you know, do books which are more compatible with the amount of time that people in um, academia actually have available to read. Yeah. So this is something we're working on. The other thing about the Forerunners model is that um, it was initially disguised, uh, designed uh, to um, be books that, um, as the name suggests, were in advance of full-length books. So it actually started out as a series where someone would get like their core idea out there or any aspect of it. And then they would still publish a full-length book, generally with us, but also sometimes with other publishers. Um, and so that is another way to think of it, that the, the short book, you know, helps open up the topic and, and also, you know, to be honest, stake a claim for the topic. Um, you know, it's a chance for a scholar to say, I'm working, uh, I'm working here. Um, yeah. And then, uh, so we do in, in um, several cases, you know, publish the short book with the idea that there will be a long one. And that can help a little bit with, with universities, but university publication requirements and the tenure and promotion process are, you know, absolutely insane. Yeah. I mean, they, they really are. And it's, it's one of the hardest things for authors to navigate. And it's one of the hardest things for us to navigate yeah. um, because the, the rules at every institution are different um, and every department they're different. <laughs> and we're trying to do what we can for, for authors, but it's, um, it, it's a really, you know, I mean, Kafka-esque is an overused you know, phrase, but it, it does feel like that sometimes. Yeah. Definitely. Insane is the right word. Yeah. Yeah.
<laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so I'm asking this question from the perspective of a master's student. Uh -huh. literature. And um, I guess my understanding, there's the traditional academic continuum. Like it'd be great to come up with a seminar paper that you turn an article away, mm -hmm. get published, or you know, have part of your dissertation that turns into a book. Mm -hmm. But for my class, I'm considering uh, this is a critical paper um, from all the option. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I just don't really know what that would look like. And so, yes, you've talked about early development developmental issues. And I guess my question is like, what are kind of the essential things that you look for? And kind of an experimental or alternative academic paper. Yeah. I think that it again comes down to argument and, and idea. Um, you know, it, it really does. And then making a compelling case for why it's taking the form that you're thinking of. Um, but, but everything just comes to, you know, what we, um, you know, what, what we sort of deal in, um, you know, just basically, uh, you know, ideas and arguments. And if the best way to express those is in some other form, um, you know, we'll, we'll very often, you know, work with a scholar to sort of, you know, see where that form might lead. Um, you know, and we, we've developed a lot of um, practices, a lot of publishing practices, which allow us to publish just different kinds of books, um, you know, and not have everything take the exact same form. So we have, for instance, a, um, an open access um, platform, which was developed with uh, the support of the Mellon Foundation called Manifold, which is actually being used now by almost 30 different publishers around the world. Um, so it's not just us, um, which allows the kind of flexibility to develop projects which are not traditional books and which can have um, digital elements, they can have pedagogical elements, and, uh, and it's all just this kind of tinker toy box of different elements that we can mix into a project to sort of achieve, you know, what an author is trying to do. But, but at the end of the day, it all comes down to, it all comes down to ideas and arguments. Uh, that's what excites us, and that's really, um, you know, what brings people to us. Yeah. Cool, very confession. So you mentioned that people increasingly read books visually, uh, and that prospective authors should have their illustration programs done. And so I wonder if there is a golden number of illustrations. <laughs> Uh, because sometimes we were told, oh, if you want to include 30, that's too many, they'll say no, or you should find, or two is too few. So do you guys have a number where you say, well, this is above uh, such and such number, no deal? Or, or, or is there more flexibility there? There's a lot of flexibility, and, and, I, I, and that makes it hard to sort of give an answer, but I will say that it, it really comes down again and again to the quality of the images and how revealing they are. Um, you know, so um, so quality is kind of obvious, um, you know, and, and um, that's just about whether the images will reproduce well, um, whether they'll reproduce well in black and white, if they need to be in color, whether we can find some kind of support for doing a color section. Those are all things which happen. But, the other thing is just what, what they're of. And sometimes, you know, you, you get manuscripts which almost have illustrations because you think, well, I should have some illustrations. And they're just like the same, they're just like things everyone already knows. And I admit we even joke sometimes about like bad screen grabs and media looks. <laughs> and it's like, you know, I don't believe I'm seeing this image again. This is even worse than last time we saw it. So, so it's partly, you know, when you can actually dig up something which like someone hasn't seen or which really reveals something or gives it a, a dimension or depth or it's been sitting in an archive, that just gets us excited. We say, well, this can pull people in. So, um, so for example, we were working, uh, maybe more, more timely than it should be, we were working with an author on a photographic study which actually was based in um, his research in the Soviet Union, and it was basically about the just continuity of pictures of Stalin. 
it was just like like everywhere and he had this like remarkable collection of just like everyday scenes in the soviet union and and and, and you could always find the picture of stalin somewhere and it was just like such a powerful way of suggesting what authoritarianism looks like um, and what made the images really remarkable, you know, was that they were in all these everyday spaces. You know, you were just sort of astounded, you know, you, it was obvious, but also just seeing it. And they were also like remarkably high quality. So, um, so it was like, yeah, we can do a book with um, 35 images <laughs> because this is really, um, it's really showing something and it's demonstrating it in a way that people aren't usually seeing. So. That can really impact. That can really impact us when an image is sort of unusual. And same thing as I've worked a lot on um, media archaeology and technology books. And you know, being able to see some of these lost technologies that sort of led to you know where we are today um, is again just a great way of, of demonstrating. That. I mean, we also have a very strong list in architectural history, and there again, you turn up just some remarkable images. So as far as a gold standard goes, um, I think a good illustration program is usually, um, you know, about five to seven images per chapter. So, Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Um, I, I, hi, thanks, by the way. My name is Lisa Hong. I just had a question that, um, about something earlier that you said about how, um, projects are kind of digested in this framework of risk assessment. Mm -hmm. um, so I was wondering what constitutes like a risky um, project in your mind? Yeah, it's, it's risk, even as it's not, um, even as it's, it's not um, fail, <laughs> but, but very often, it's deciding what is an area and what isn't an area. And, you know, you can look back now and say, you know, oh, it was always obvious that this scholarship had a use, but with a press um, such as Minnesota, especially, we're just always looking at what an author is doing and saying, you know, you know, can this build into something? Is this happening? So, I mean, it will sound almost comical, but we are one of the early presses in animal studies. And it, it like, it truly was not an area. And this wasn't even that long ago. This was, you know, less than 20 years ago. And I, I, there were only a few scholars we could even go to to review projects. Um, you know, so you were, we were worried about even getting any, like, knowledge. And so I was having coffee with a scholar who had been sort of a pioneer in, the, in this area. And I sort of, this was when it was already kind of happening. And I said, well, yeah, I mean, the animal studies thing is really happening. We're sort of over that barrier. And he said, that's ridiculous. No, we're not. He's saying, you, you talked to scholars trying to get tenure with a project about animals. It's like this, you know, it may, it may be, you know, Minnesota may be where it needs to be, but academia isn't where it needs to be. And this goes again and again in areas we develop where we're just asking ourselves, you know, is this something we should invest in? So something we've been investing in recently is um, curiosity studies, you know, and just sort of the importance of, curiosity in terms of you know, breaking scholarship free from a lot of traditional disciplines and modes of thought, and just how much following thoughts has a political resonance. Um, and so, um, so when this first started coming up, it's like, you know, is this gonna be a thing for us? You know, is this, is this something that enough people will be interested in? So, so the risk is partly that as a press that's doing you know, about 80 new manuscripts a year, we don't have all the space we'd like, um, you know, but that's what we can do um, on current staff and without driving ourselves crazy. Um, it's just like, how do we deploy these spaces? You know, what, what work can we, you know, bring forward? And so, uh, so it's partly just taking this like big, you know, machine of, you know, publishing thing and like deciding what to, what to put it behind and whether it's going to get somewhere. And we guess right enough of the time. <laughs> yeah. Can I ask a question just about? Um, I mean, how do you see the future of print? Um, do you think it is going to be the horizon of publication for the foreseeable future, or do you think see things sort of migrating more in the direction of the manifold sort of platform, writ large? Yeah. 
it, it doesn't seem like print is going to go anywhere. Um, last year, um, sort of mid pandemic or high pandemic or whatever we want to call it was, you know, my press is most successful year in 20 years for the number of books sold. Um, and that's physical books. Um, actually, our, our digital books, our ebooks went up as well. So it was a like super successful year. A lot of that is because there's nothing more socially distanced than reading a book. Um, it, it was just a time when reading books um, was something that people were doing, but the, there were some other things going on inside that. But one thing was, is that it was, I think, to a great extent, um, a vote for offline time. Um, it, this is, you know, this is not substantiated, but we're, we're just dealing with a period where so much of our lives and our professions are, are online. We're just constantly staring at screens, um, you know, to, to go to classes, to advise students or be advised. You're just on a screen all the time. And, uh, and screens demand a certain kind of reaction. Um, books are just more passive, uh, you know, but books you can take at your own pace, you can read them at your own pace. And I think a lot of people seem to return to print books. Um, during the period of the pandemic specifically. Uh, where we go is the, we go into the, the next phase of this, I, I don't really know. Um, but even then, there, there's, a, there's a, a great sort of feeling of um, connection between print. Uh, the um, Ithaca, um, which is basically the, the sort of research end of JSTOR, of the journal source JSTOR, does a survey every two years where they ask scholars how they want to use information, how they want to use knowledge. Um, and so they do a survey of scholars, like, you know, you know, what purposes are best for print? What purposes are best for digital? You know, what do you access? And they get, you know, great data, which actually studies this issue and, and looks at it longitudinally to understand how it's changed and how it hasn't changed. And one thing that comes up again and again is that the digital is great for discovery, but it's just not great for reading. And that people consult digital resources a lot um, when they're looking for something specific. Um, but, um, but then, you know, very often, at least the Ithaca data shows this, that they go from accessing a digital copy to wanting a print one when they feel they need to spend time with it. So that suggests to me that print is going to have a great staying power. Um, so um, you know, our own program, uh, even before, you know, it became sort of a, a little bit of a norm with the pandemic, our, our own program is, is a very hybrid one. Um, we digitize, you know, we, we made a practice of releasing our books and ebooks simultaneously with print um, years ago um, because we wanted to get, you know, all, all the kinds of views we could find we went back and basically found a way to digitize almost every book back to 1925 so that they would have their digital presence as well as print. Um, so um, so they're, they're totally compatible modes. Um, and, and I just, and I hope they stay that way. There's one other pressure on them though, which does make me worry, um, which is that, um, you know, as libraries have reasonably taken advantage of technology to have largely digital collections, um, they're not really investing in um, books. They're only getting access to them when they need them. So that means that basically the, the presses are themselves providing most of the capital to publish these scholarly books. Uh, it used to be that a library up front would buy six or 700 copies of a scholarly book, and that was only a decade ago, and that's now more like 150. Um, so there's a like real large um, sort of um, decline in investment that we're dealing with. And the worst thing is, is that uh, that's getting built into the prices that individual scholars pay for books. So this is basically, in a lot of ways, a cost shift to scholars and students. Um, to source their own research materials. And so um, it makes it more, more difficult um, economically, but I'm, I'm very worried, um, especially as um, prices have been driven up with sort of some of the logistical issues of the post-pandemic time. I'm really worried of what might happen to prices, um, just to sort of 
get the paper um, to do books. We'll figure out. So we also have a question uh, from uh, via the Zoom platform. Uh, whether or not you have any suggestions of particularly compelling multimedia-based books or non-traditional text published by Minnesota that you'd recommend? Yeah, um, well, our Manifold collection and our Manifold platform has a lot of what we do in terms of uh, multimedia projects. Um, and uh, so our, our collection, I think now is it's definitely over 100 books, um, shows how different authors have used that platform. Um, it includes some books which are like not very adventurous, um, but some which really are pretty adventurous. And so um, to give an example, um, an author I've been in discussion with for a long time named um, Whitney Tredian has sort of looked at the practice of bookmaking in the early modern period and how it sort of understood in an early form what we later rediscovered as digital tools. Um, the whole idea is of remixing texts, of joining them together, of you know, cutting and pasting, that everything which we think of as part of the sort of digital space of writing was actually done literally with paste and you know, um, stitching um, at another time. So she's able to link out from that project to um, digital images of a lot of these texts um, and um, that author that, that readers can explore at their own pace. Um, so that that to me is a great example of the use of this. Um, I also have a real soft spot for books where um, that we've done digitally, which um, show the means of their creation online, which document how they were created. So uh, we uh, did a, we we're just about to publish in print a book called The Lab Book, which is about the history of the media lab and of the humanities lab, um, a collaborative project by scholars on um, one in Canada, one in North America, and one in uh, continental Europe. And they you know, fanned out and just um, documented uh, media labs across um, academia um, throughout the world and uh, interviewed people who had founded them or who had shut them down in some cases, they documented them photographically. And what makes this a great digital project is that uh, the book is there um, to read the, their conclusions and what they found, but all the research materials are online with it. Uh, so if you wanted to get further into it, uh, there's transcripts of all of the interviews they did. There's the complete photographic collection of stuff which isn't in the book to show what these spaces look like. And what they're really trying to do is go back and critically think, what does it mean when humanities in particular moves from a classroom and library model to a lab model? What does that look like? What works? What doesn't work? Um, what is it as a process? And to me, it's just a great investigation of this. And I said, what I love about it is that readers can go in and just sort of understand what underlies this, what research underlies it. And this goes to a sort of idea I, I've had a lot about multimedia projects in particular, which is that we, we need as, as presses ideally to start these projects earlier. We need to think of them as research projects, not as books. Um, the book is a output of this. It's a reason for it. It's a culmination of it. But what's really exciting is actually you know, all of the research that people create along the way, the like individual archives. And uh, I was at a scholarly conference, I don't mean to go on and on about this, at a scholarly conference that was convened by MIT about you know, archives and what should be in archives. And I said, well, the, the, the people to talk to are, are scholars because they're creating archives all the time. You know, that's part of scholarship. You're constantly creating um, archives. And, that making that information not go fugitive, not, leave, not live on hard drives of technology, which is going to become inaccessible and outdated and, you know, which no one will be able to share because they don't even know it exists. That's the material to save. That's the material to preserve in a multimedia way where people can explore it later. And um, so, so I think that, you know, a lot of the point of multimedia projects is not, um, you know, what makes just the thing you read, it's what underlies it. It's like what knowledge and research underlies it. Thank you. Yeah. 
Um, I have another question. So earlier this month, we had a workshop on writing for the public. And so I was kind of wondering um, if you could talk a little bit about like crossover publishing and how different that process might be from like traditional epic publishing. Yeah, we, we do a lot of um, crossover books. And you know, very often, I think, you know, what you're aiming for here is a a, a more general audience of scholars, um, you know, and, and somewhere along there, there's, you know, general readers too, but it's also, you know, trying to get out of, you're just sort of um, part of that. And, uh, and so it springs from an author wanting to communicate more broadly, and also to some extent having the vocation to do so. It's a lot harder um, to write a book for um, a sort of broader audience, even if it's still an academic book. Um, so part means, you know, introducing topics, explaining them, finding other ways to say things. Um, so it does take, you know, a lot of work, but the, the result can be um, really spectacular. Um, and uh, so we're always looking for books that have that potential and then working with authors to write books that can um, in a way that can sort of bring that out. So just a couple examples of where that comes in. These are all, I got to say, academic books, but they're really great books. So we're working, one of our editors is working with an author now on the history of um, African-Americans and fast food, um, you know, is sort of a process, sort of almost the backstory for how the customer base of the fast food industries turned out to be so heavily, you know, people of color, in particular African Americans, and how that happened very specifically. And it's a, you know, it's a great, great topic, and she has wonderful research materials. And it's like, so how do we bring this out? You know, we're totally from another part of the list. We have a project of what's going on in Siberia now in terms of, um, you know, the melting of um, the permafrost and what's being revealed from that. Um, and it's again, you know, a, you know, someone who has spent a lot of research time in Russia and has talked to people who are feeling this changed environment and it's not coming out. So we're saying, well, there's something here which should be communicated more broadly. And now we work with the authors to do that. And so you want to make sure you have an author who is willing to do that, who is willing to do that writing work. And, um, and that's what really gets you there. And sometimes, um, they'll just want to write a straight ahead monogram instead, and that's fine. But if you can find an author who wants to do that, um, it's really, it's really great. Yeah. No, 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 um, so this is something you uh, talked about in the past. Uh, just it stayed with me uh, so strong. You kind of iterated some today which is the idea that authors should contact you early and often, actually, to be in dialogue mm -hmm. about a work, even at the idea stages, just to like let you know things are percolating, there are ideas out there, and you know, what are you seeing in your world, and what are you seeing within this idea that is um, exciting? Mm -hmm. so you talk a little bit about that kind of ongoing dialogue that happens. You mentioned it some as one person but. Yeah, it's um, it is really useful, and it part tracks back to that um, fable I um, subjected everyone to earlier. That it's that, you know, what what we're looking for is where work connects with other work, and we're in a really good position to know that. Um, you know, even in a networked world, scholars are often working in, in incredible isolation. <laughs> you know, and we don't only know what work is out there, we know what work is coming. You know, we can see it building. We can see these areas coming together and coalescing. And so a lot of times working with authors, um, you know, creating a dialogue as they're working on projects, we're able to say, you know, I think this is building towards this because, you know, the book is, is a conversation. It needs sort of the audience and the authors two different things. And we can help shape a book towards what we see as emerging conversations or areas you know similarly we can just sort of you know say well you know the way you're structuring this you know doesn't seem to really 
you know, take advantage of what's happening right now or of what conversations is happening. And it could be when you say that to a, a scholar, they go to another press that sees it differently or sees it in a more monographic way. Um, but it, it's, it's good to sort of have those conversations earlier so that the project is being shaped. Um, the thing which I've really missed in uh, the virtual era, um, the pandemic era, is that um, going to scholarly conferences and, and meeting with scholars and speaking to them, I, I just really miss that. And that doesn't mean we don't get great proposals, because we're still getting like fantastic proposals, and in fact, more than we can publish, uh, which is the hardest part of all this. Um, but very often um, at conferences, what would happen is that you'd just be talking to someone or they'd come by your display and they start talking about a project that they thought wasn't a project or that interested them. And they thought, no, that isn't really a thing. And you could just say, no, that's actually really interesting. Tell me more about that. And so what we're losing access to are the really interesting, offbeat, innovative projects. Um, the sort of standard, you know, sort of ones that are working in uh, established areas of discourse, those are all coming through and we see those, but, uh, but seeing those ones that are really breakouts, you know, are really hard to, really hard to track at this point. And uh, it's also part of the early warning system, which again goes to the fables idea of like overhearing conversations, that all of a sudden you go to a conference and you hear three people talk about, you know, a similar thing, you say, oh, that's, that's happening. You know that that that's really happening, and uh, you know so uh, you know things, especially that impinge on less known areas of discourse, first come to your attention from those kinds of conversations, and uh, and so when someone comes up and they say, "Oh, I can see that how that how that plays into that," people are working on this. There's an audience for this. There's a receptiveness. So yeah, it's great to you know self interest. It's just great to know what's coming and to be sort of prepared for it and receptive to it. In terms of an author's interest, um, a good editor, you know, is partly an advisor, you know, as you're sort of coming up with things and they can take an early look at a proposal and say, I don't know if I'd quite do it that way or why is this chapter in here? <laughs> you know, what, is this, what work is this doing? Um, and very often they'll say, oh, well, my, my graduate advisor said I needed to have a chapter on <laughs> such and such. It's like, eh. Maybe not for this purpose. That's just dead. So. We have time. Let's see. How long is this go to? Till one, right? Yeah, we've got, we've got time for uh, one or two more questions. Can you talk a little bit about style? Yeah. Style. Um, Style's a rare thing. <laughs> um, you know, style in, in an academic manuscript, um, you know, a, an author who, um, again, it, it sort of comes down to risks that sometimes deploying style, you know, takes a, a real risk from, from an author and, uh, and style tends to be dictated by discipline and by approach. And so you'll get in a lot of cases, people who are, you know, writing in the mode of things that they've um, been reading or books that have influenced them. And so, um, so you're always kind of a little bit aware of that. But when, when an author is um, getting at something a little bit differently, that really does um, stand out. And sometimes you can sort of push them a little bit towards that. And sometimes you're really surprised um, at what can come out of it. So, I mean, I think an example of, and, and the other thing I should say about style too is that sometimes style, um, when it's not standard, doesn't peer review well, um, because um, the peer review process itself is like super conservative. And we sometimes have to adjust for that, like out of the peer reviews, literally say, okay, don't pay any attention to this, this recommendation. Um, but, uh, but it is it basically, it has a tendency in academia to all sort of get down to the same approach. And the approach runs mostly on disciplinary rails and we try and so um, style is an element in the consideration process, just in sort of saying to people, um, you know, as I'll say, well, you know, this chapter seems the one where you're really speaking in your true voice. Um, 
and these other chapters not so much. And often there's a reason for that, um, you know, why something comes up. But uh, every manuscript uh, has different origins, and sometimes the origin is in, you know, conference oral presentation, and sometimes it's in journal publication, and sometimes it was written originally for that. And so sometimes in a manuscript, when you're piecing it together, you're just sort of looking at, well, what is what is this author's natural style and, and, and which part of their own manuscript should they um, imitate? Yeah, it's a, a, an extension of Ron's question. And you're saying different cultures have different, um, different disciplines of different cultures of publication. In some cultures, it's a publication has produced a series of scholarly journal articles and essays. And then you're in a position to write a book. Yeah. Then the question becomes, what kind of yeah. Uh, are you going to write a book that says that pulls in these series of essays and scholarly journal articles in some way, or are you going to take a bigger risk mm -hmm. <laughs> and a stylistic risk and write something a little off the mainstream with a scholarly essay or journal piled together, compiled together in a book? So I wonder if you could talk about that, if how these different cultures of publication lead to different styles of books. Mm -hmm. And which styles work? Yeah. And which styles fail? <laughs> yeah. It's partly work for what, of course. Yeah. Um, because if you're, um, if you think of the, the audience for a book in concentric circles, um, which is, I think, how I usually think of the audience, um, if a scholar is trying to hit sort of the, the bullseye, um, the specialist bullseye, you know, then you want it to satisfy those people most of all. But as you go to larger rings, you do take more risks every time with drawing in a broader group of people. And so you have to sort of, um, you know, I think it's one point, you just have to think about who you want to be in conversation with, you know, who you want to read. And again, looking at a proposal, a lot of times what I'm looking at is, you know, who, who, who's being cited here as an influence on this book? What kind of book does this want to be? And um, sometimes an author is um, really wonderfully um, ambitious in terms of how big an audience they want to hit. And what that means sometimes is that the scholarly journal articles, especially if a book is coming out of the social sciences, um, act as the evidence yeah. for a book, but not really as the sample. Yeah. You know, and, uh, and so when someone has like a group of articles that cohere, um, it, you do sometimes just sort of say, well, rather than just publishing these as demonstrations of the points you're going to make in the introduction, it's just a monographic form. It's like, let's think about how, the, how all this gets re, reworked and remixed, you know, into a, into a broader work. And the disjunction, 90% of the time, the disjunction comes between the ambition set out in the um, general argument and description part of the proposal and the chapter summaries. Um, because you'll see the real excitement, the intellectual excitement in the description, and you look at the chapter summaries, and there's this like incredible letdown. It's like you know, it's like oh, th this isn't actually going to get there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, so at least in my case, you usually just present that observation to the author and just see if they're still game. You know, do, do you want to do this if we're really going to try it? You know get more juice out of this. Now, I think that's one reason the Forerunner series has been so successful, because mm -hmm. it doesn't fall prey to these problems, some of these problems, because it's an idea argument yeah. in a short form. Yeah. Yeah, and I would really like to, I'd really like to build out that model um, in sort of versions from the same, you know, editorial philosophy and the same workflow that got us to that. I'd like mm -hmm. to build it out to sort of larger works. Um, without sort of throwing off Forerunners yeah, yeah. itself. So, um, so yeah, Forerunners all along was a stalking horse yeah. uh, or an experiment. It was like, how can we make yeah. this work? You know, can, yeah. can a complex academic idea really be presented in 10 to 15,000 words? And it's short, it's readable, it's affordable. I can afford, I can go to your press's... Uh, you know, at a conference and buy like two or three of these. Yeah. And it's fine. And I can read them on the plane home. Yeah. Know? Or in a bar or something. It's, it's fabulous that way. 
Um, I mean, they're also fast. We do yeah. them in 12 weeks instead of 12 months. Um, so, you know, though lately that, that's been slowing down a bit because we have to find pay for the print. Which is huge. I don't know if people know about that problem. Yeah. Well, the biggest, you know, you, you keep hearing in the general media about the supply chain problem, and it's it's hitting publishing, you know, really hard at this point. It's uh, literally, um, you know, just getting things, getting the paper to print things on, getting the glue to hold them together is like a constant concern right now. Um, and so uh, as I joke to people, and it isn't really a joke, of course, you know, I spent my entire career trying to find people to read the books that, you know, I've published. And now I'm spending all my time trying to find, trying to get books to sell to people who want them. Because it's, it's just really difficult just to get them out. And everything's taking longer. And we're part of this, you know, worldwide logistics nightmare of uh, stuff being, you know, tied up in transit. And uh, so the, the whole idea of the... Um, digital in some way, you know, solving the need to, um, the carbon footprint idea is definitely not paid off because, you know, there's a, there's a massive demand right now for, for print and it's, it's just super difficult to get everything you need. And the printers by and what large don't have the staff to, um, you know, don't have the staff to print them right now. I mean, there's a, you know, there's a staffing shortage as well. So it's a, it's a tricky time um, for that. And uh, we navigate around this, a lot, um, but you know, it's it's going to be a challenge going forward. Well, um, thank you, Doug, sure. for being here. Uh, thank you to online folks. Um, and so, get your ideas out there and send them to publishers. <laughs> thank you.